Thanks for coming out this afternoon. Um, so the lecture today is the globalization of energy resources. I'm going to look up here because I think the title's changed a little bit. Uh, Tapping oil and gas from the Caspian and Russia. I'm Matt Rosenstein. I'm the Associate Director of the Program in Arms Control, Disarmament, and International Security, or ACTIS. Uh, and I'm really pleased to introduce our talk and our speaker this afternoon, Jonathan Elkind. The Center for Advanced Study Initiative on Globalization examines how scholars, artists, writers, and policymakers have dealt with the issue of transnational connectedness in contemporary times. The Center for Advanced Study is not alone in undertaking this vast endeavor. The number of co-sponsors who have signed on to this initiative attest to the interest across campus for what global culture looks like from a multifaceted perspective. The list is too long to read here, but the Center would in particular like to thank uh, those units on campus responsible for helping to bring uh, John Elkine today. Uh, those units include my own, ACTUS, the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Center, the Center for Global Studies, the Environmental Council, and also the University YMCA. The first lecture in this series was delivered in 2002. Uh, the series has addressed topics like the production, distribution, and consumption of food as a global phenomenon, martial arts and the globalization of the film industry, the roots of violence undertaken in the name of Islam, and prospects for peace in South Asia. But today our attention turns to energy and to the former Soviet Union. Now the dissolution of the USSR in 1991 brought with it tremendous challenges for Russia, the former Soviet republics, and indeed the rest of the world, which now faced a dramatically changed and changing geopolitical landscape. But the end of the Soviet era was also accompanied by a good deal of optimism uh, for an in, or in anticipation of the expansion of democracy, um, new financial opportunities from the transition from uh, command economies to market economies, and in anticipation of the forging of new transnational partnerships that weren't previously possible. Within this context, the oil and natural gas reserves in the Caspian and, and in Russia offer the promise of an important source of energy resources for global consumers. Yet tapping these resources also uh, has proven to involve a complex set of actors with an equally, equally complex set of interests, which makes the Caspian reserves an interesting case study in the intersection of geopolitics, economics, energy security, and indeed the forces of globalization. Uh, so we've invited our speaker to provide us with a window into these dynamics today. Jonathan Elkind is an independent consultant on energy, environment, and investment, and heads uh, the East Link consulting firm. He has advised BP in relation to its projects in the Caspian region. From 1998 to 2001, Elkind served on the staff of the US National Security Council as the director for Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian affairs. Before that, he worked on the National Security Affairs staff of Vice President Al Gore as advisor for the former Soviet Union. And he also coordinated the US Department of Energy's cooperative programs with Russia and Ukraine. Elkind received an MBA degree from the University of Maryland. He also has degrees in Soviet history from Columbia University and we'll forgive him for this one from the University of Michigan. Uh, John. Well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here um, uh, with you today. Uh, and I hope that the discussion today will prompt a lot of questions on your part. Um, and I would encourage you, uh, if you wish, to um, break in at any point and uh, ask questions as we go along in the interest of uh, more of a give and take. Um, what I'm going to try to cover today is uh, along these lines. I'll start by talking a little bit about the, uh, some context setting, what the current state of uh, global and regional energy markets currently looks like, and the reason 
that uh, I have uh, surreptitiously inserted the word and words and Russia into the presentation today is because will then become quite apparent to you, I think. If one wishes to get oil and gas uh, resources from the Caspian and uh, the Caspian region to global markets, um, first and foremost, one confronts a question about transportation. It is the transportation of hydrocarbons to market that allows uh, a country to monetize a resource that is otherwise an interesting uh, set of geology. As soon as one utters the word money or monetize, it will not be lost on you that one immediately then moves into the zone of politics and control and security interests. I'll talk a little bit about uh, energy transportation throughout the uh, post-Soviet space as it currently exists. And then I want to look at two uh, specific uh, subsets of our topic today. One is the gas trade in the post-Soviet uh, states, where the role of the Caspian uh, countries, and in particular the Central Asian countries, is particularly important, but where there is on the stage a great behemoth of another actor, that being the Russian uh, uh, principally state-owned uh, company Gazprom. Finally, I'll talk about the uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan projects, uh, and I will repeat in the interests of uh, uh, you know, fair warning or full disclosure or what have you, that a portion of the work that I've done uh, since leaving government service uh, is, for, is consulting for BP, which is the operator of those projects. So, to, to context setting, um, I will simply tell you, uh, stress to you what I think uh, everybody in the room knows already, which is that we are today in a period of high, but by comparison on a real, on a, uh, excuse me, on a real money uh, basis, not historically uh, record setting, uh, prices for oil uh, in the global markets. Um, I won't belabor that point, simply to say that we've been living in a high price environment uh, for the last uh, five years. This slide which presents spot oil prices uh, for two of the marker crudes, the benchmarks uh, uh, West Texas Intermediate and Brent, uh, makes the point as well, though with greater detail, it emphasizes that of late, we have been in a period where there has been a drop-off um, in price. It comes against the, ba the backdrop of this general uh, long-running uh, increase in prices, which dates back to uh, the, the run-up, right about here, the run-up to uh, the Iraq War. Um, but I'm just to, just to de-emphasize the point that we are still today in what is a comparatively uh, elevated price environment for oil, um, and everybody optimistically, I think, hopes that the prices uh, may start to relax a bit. Add into the mix what the dynamics have been for production, and this slide shows uh, oil only, not gas, production of oil, crude oil, uh, in the post-Soviet world. What this graphic emphasizes is the substantial rebound in production in Russia, which is this, uh, the, the bottom part of the graphic, that has taken place in the period since the Russian financial crisis in 1998. So you've got a convergence that's going on uh, of high prices and production rebounds. Interestingly, you can also see here a significant share of, that comes from Kazakhstan and that has been steadily increasing and will further in the 2011-12 time frame substantially increase yet again uh, as a new project called the Kashagan project starts to come online. But the general picture here that I want to stress in relation to the Caspian countries is that of all of the production in the post-Soviet states they are a change at the margin. They're not the big behemoth. That's the, the production in Russia. Enough for context setting. 
Moving now to the idea of, to the, to the issue of transportation of oil and gas uh, in the post-Soviet states. The, the first point that I want to really emphasize is that one, when one looks at the oil and gas transportation systems uh, of the post-Soviet world, one is looking at a substantially unaltered holdover of infrastructure that was designed for and built in a different time. Um, it's clear uh, to this audience that, of course, the Soviet uh, oil and gas ministries set the agenda from Moscow in the previous time. Um, and, sorry. Set the agenda, made the decisions, created the priorities, built the infrastructure, operated the systems. All of those roles were in one set of hands. Um, and this is, I, I'm not making a, a, a political critique, this is simply a logical thing in that an integrated USSR had a set of needs uh, that were reflected in the industrial infrastructure of that time. One can see this very clearly by looking at this map, and I apologize for the busyness of this, but the, 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 es the essential message that one is seeing is the following. If you look at um, the Caucasus region or Central Asia, you will notice that, and this is a, a, a map as of this time last year, you will notice that all of the pipelines run from the, uh, the Caspian region up into what was the industrial uh, zone of the USSR, and from there only, export routings going, for example, the Druzhba system here, going into Central Europe, um, the gas systems, the Brotherhood system that comes from West Siberia all the way down and it feeds uh, into Germany and the rest of the integrated Western European system. So the basic point is, these were systems designed for a different time, and their, and their shape and uh, other parameters reflect that. It's a different day today, however. Since 1991, with 15 uh, independent post-Soviet countries, the running of pipelines uh, in the way that was demonstrated by the, the map just a moment ago um, does not reflect does not respond to national priorities um, and does not either respond to the national security implications um, of, the, uh, uh, of the energy infrastructure. Then we come to the interesting bit with the national security and the political, uh, the, the political uh, subtext. I remind the, the basic point that I uh, highlighted a moment, uh, at the outset. Um, oil and gas deposits not pulled out of the ground and, de and delivered to market yield no uh, financial impact to the countries that are their owners and yield no, uh, um, no financial impact and therefore no political impact either. So the ability to allocate scarcity, which lies in the hands of those controlling the decisions about the operation of oil and, and gas pipeline systems, is a terribly, terribly important role. By determining whose oil gets to market, you have the, the ability to determine winners and losers in the marketplace. You also have the ability to exploit huge opportunities for rent seeking. And in the world of the post Soviet space today, that is one of the most fundamental and recurring uh, parts of the picture uh, is non transparency um, with the effect, whether intended or not, one can have a separate conversation, with the effect of creating huge opportunities for rent-seeking.
I want to talk next about two of the specific organizations that play linchpin roles um, in this area that I've been discussing, namely the transportation of oil and gas to markets. They are both Russian organizations. And again, that's why um, I uh, made the decision that in order to talk about the Caspian intention, uh, intelligently, one needed also to have a discussion that incorporated discussion of uh, Russian interests, Russian policies, and Russian institutions. Transneft is the name of the Russian state-owned company uh, which is responsible for the design, construction, and operation of crude oil pipelines uh, within the country. Uh, Transneft has both a very important economic uh, role um, and a very potent political role as well. Um, I think it is important to acknowledge both in relation to Transneft and also Gazprom, which I'll speak about more uh, in a couple of minutes, the considerable um, capacity that each of these organizations uh, represents and the considerable technical achievements that each of these organizations um, uh, has uh, uh, created, has yielded over time. Uh, if you stop and think about the uh, extent of the uh, dissolution of political, economic, and social systems after 1991, dissolution that I happen to think w was perfectly understandable in context and on net a, a good thing both for those countries and for the rest of the world, nonetheless, the simple fact that Transneft and Gazprom were able to keep pasted together more often than not with chewing gum and bailing wire in those, in those early post-Soviet days, that they were able to keep pasted together the oil and gas transportation systems. This is a non-trivial point. Um, and I don't mean in, in any of my um, critical commentary in this discussion, I never mean to uh, uh, in any way fail to acknowledge that these are organizations that have played very important roles on behalf of the government to which, uh, the, to which they, uh, they report. In the period, um, particularly since the, uh, the financial crash uh, of the ruble in 1998, the economic fundamentals for the production of uh, oil in Russia have been exceptionally favorable. Uh, the devaluation of the ruble meant that production costs were de facto lowered because people continued to be paid in rubles and the, uh, the devaluation did not catch up with uh, 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 the costs of, uh, of production. And so you had a huge bump that was shown in that early slide, that big yellow mass that represents the increase in Russian oil production uh, over the period since 1998. The limiting factor in many, many cases has been the ability of uh, the oil producers in Russia, and even more so oil producers in Central Asia who might be uh, uh, secondarily reliant on the Transnet system to get access to the pipeline system in order to get their product to market. Pipelines for distances up to, um, uh, and this is a very intentionally crude number, you know, kind of 2,000 kilometers, 2,500, 3,000 kilometers, pipelines are far and away the, the most cost effective means to move crude oil. But a huge portion of the crude oil production in Russia and from the Caspian region in this period has not had access to the pipelines. And so the producers were forced to be chasing after tanker rail cars, barges, and other means of transportation which are exceptionally inefficient from an economic perspective 
and also have a lot of other deleterious impacts in terms of environmental uh, effects. So point number one that I am trying to make about Transneft in the period since 1998 is that its capacity, which has grown in this period steadily, its capacity nonetheless has not come close to paralleling um, the demand for transportation services. And that, of course, creates the demand, the, the, the dynamic which, if you are Transneft or governmental officials making decisions about who gets to use the Transneft system, it's a beautiful, it's a classic economist's uh, allocation of scarcity um, uh, situation. So there's lots and lots of power in that. On a technical level, another comment about the Transneft system. In most contemporary pipeline systems elsewhere in the world, um, there are techniques that are used to ensure that a producer who puts high quality oil into the front of the pipe, so to speak, gets compensated when that company sells that product to a refiner, gets compensated in a way that reflects the value of that high quality product. Um, let me state the, the basics, and I, and I hope this uh, is, is recognized that one talks about crude oil as if it is a single identical thing, but there are physical chemical properties about different grades of oil that make certain uh, crude qualities more attractive for certain uh, refiners, depending on what the uh, design parameters are of a given refinery, um, and that make certain crude, uh, crudes more attractive depending on the environmental and other uh, regulatory regimes uh, that surround uh, that, that uh, refiner. Quality banking is the term that's used to uh, refer to this uh, set of techniques that I've just been talking about. And basically the idea is that if you put your crude oil into a system where that crude cannot be segregated from the next batch that follows on, if your crude gets mongrelized along with everybody else's, then you should, as an accounting matter, you should be compensated for putting in the higher quality product, the higher quality production into that uh, system, uh, no matter to whom it is sold and, and at what price. The Transneft system does not have quality banking, does not use the, uh, the technique. As a consequence, um, low uh, sulfur crudes, for example, from uh, Azerbaijan get mixed together with higher sulfur, uh, higher viscosity crudes from West Siberia, uh, from the Tatarstan uh, region. Um, and so there is an inherent loss of value if you're producing light sweet crudes in Azerbaijan, for example. Um, there's an inherent loss of value if you put that production into the Transneft system. Who is the loss to? The loss is to the, whoever is the title holder of that oil when it comes out of the ground. So if I'm the producer, typically the way that these, uh, uh, th there are a variety of legal instruments that can determine whose oil that barrel is. Um, sometimes it's done on the basis of production sharing agreements. I can talk about that a little bit later. Sometimes it's done on the basis of uh, license and royalty arrangements. But whoever, is the, whoever holds the title, at that point when it goes into the pipeline system, loses the value. Another effect of the capacity limitations of uh, the Transneft system have been very, very evident in Russian crude oil pricing in the winter periods. In the winter, when all of a sudden that barge traffic um, is substantially constrained, restricted, because of uh, weather patterns uh, and, uh, and ice on the rivers. In winter times, you would see a five and even more, 10, $15 per barrel um, drop in the domestic price of Ural's blend. That's the crude uh, quality that comes out of the Transneft system. So you'd find that differential between the domestic price for Euro's blend and the export price. 
Enough about transneft. I want to move now to um, uh, gas, and I'm going to try to pick up my pace a little bit. Oops. Okay. We were just talking about the, the, the oil side of the uh, monopoly world, and here's the gas side. Gazprom is a, basically the today's form of what used to be the uh, uh, ministry of the gas industry in Soviet times. It is the uh, predominantly state-owned Russian company that produces, namely extracts, uh, gas from the ground, that transports it uh, across the country, that sells it uh, onward to end consumers. And the basic proposition that this company operates under is cheap gas for Russia in exchange for uh, a basically unrestricted ability, an unrestricted role, in fact, a legally unique role as the exporter not only of gas from Russia, but gas that flows through Russia. Um, Gazprom is the behemoth of the Russian economy. Uh, in 2004, I, I, I don't have uh, 2005 data to hand, uh, its exports amounted to 140 billion cubic meters uh, of gas sold into Central and Western Europe. Um, and basically, that export quantity, which is about 25%, of Gazprom's activities, and which amounted to, uh, as, it, as it shows here, just under $20 billion of revenue in 2004, that basically carries the gas industry domestically, where the prices are comparatively very low. Now, in the early um, post-breakup days, the Gazprom CEO, whose name was Rem Vyakhirev, um, operated the company as if it was, and this is the, the uniform term that was used, it was the state within the state. In Putin's time, if anything, that institution has grown stronger still. Putin has seven out of the 11 board members are people from either the government of the Russian Federation or from the Kremlin staff itself. In 2003, when Putin went with Gerhard Schroeder to Ekaterinburg, uh, there was a bit of a tiff going on at that time between uh, Brussels and the EU member states and Russia over whether the depressed, comparatively, uh, gas prices within Russia amounted to a, uh, an unfair subsidy for uh, Russian industrial production. And Putin railed, it was one of these moments where all of a sudden he kind of went on tilt, and you, you got this feeling that this was the, the unscripted real deal. He said that the bureaucrats in Brussels would have to understand that when it came to gas, Europe would have no choice but to deal with the state. Today, even more so, as Putin gets ready for his presumed departure from the presidency, the politics of Gazprom look to be intertwined with the politics of post-Putin Russia. Now let's look at Central Asia a little bit more. The problem that Gazprom faces today is that it has, it is not that it lacks reserves. There are huge deposits of gas, second in the world, um, I'm sorry, first in the world in gas, uh, huge deposits, chiefly in the Arctic and near Arctic regions in West Siberia. The wellhead price, the price of pulling that gas out of the ground is comparatively it's on the, on the order of eight to 10 times more expensive than pulling the same amount of gas out of the ground in Central Asia. And given that Gazprom, as rich as it is, is capital constrained, it is only natural that Gazprom has tried to gobble up production from Central Asia in order to satisfy 
its consumers in Central and Western Europe. This comes also at a time when um, Central Asia is going through its own set of post-dissolution uh, political dynamics. And unlike when uh, President Nazarbayev or Niyazov uh, from Kazakhstan and, and uh, Turkmenistan speak with uh, American political leaders, when they talk to Mr. Putin, they hear nothing about democratic development, balance in the development of the economy, et cetera. So you can see here the development of a very potentially uh, complicated dynamic where Gazprom has an explicit interest to try to monopolize the production coming out of Central Asia in order to meet Gazprom's supply commitments. And then Central Asians, in turn, um, have a real ease, in principle, to work with uh, a political partner that doesn't ask them meddlesome questions in the way that um, uh, others uh, have been known to do. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here, but I will just uh, say, and if people are interested in this, please ask me later. Um, the presence, the extent of Gazprom's uh, domination of central and western supply, uh, supplies of gas, and increasingly um, of assets in the gas industry is a big story that lies behind um, uh, the narrative that I'm providing today. I'll finish with uh, the gas bit by uh, highlighting a couple of specific things. This is a great time to be in the European gas market. Gas prices, natural gas prices, um, which as a general rule are built on, excuse me, reflect in part alternative fuels that somebody could burn in their power plant uh, if gas were not available. These prices have been going steadily upward quarter after quarter to the point where now they are pushing uh, the neighborhood of $300 per thousand cubic meters, okay? In Russia, the analogous price um, is in the 40 to, 30s to 40s per thousand cubic meters for comparative purposes. And so this all brings to a head the question of how will Gazprom treat um, potential producers around the Caspian and other parts of the value chain between uh, the production sites either in Russia or in, the central, in Central Asia and the big money that is to be made in Central and Western Europe. As you'll see here in the middle and as you will have seen in the press, the chief issue has been how fast will individual countries among the post-Soviet neighbors how fast and how high will their, uh, their ga gas prices change? Last year, this led to utter confrontation with Ukraine and the cutoff of gas supplies. Will that recur in Georgia this year? Will it recur with Ukraine this year? Wait and see. Um, I won't take any more time on gas right now. I'd like to just Please feel free to return to this in questions if you wish. If anybody is interested in this topic of the patterns of gas trade within uh, uh, Central Asia in particular, but the, uh, the post-Soviet uh, region more broadly, I very strongly recommend this report, um, which is, I'll give you a proper site at the end, uh, which is uh, put out by Global Witness, the pro-transparency NGO uh, based in the UK. And this is about um, the incredible lengths uh, to which uh, Turkmenistan, Russia, and Ukraine have gone to keep gas in the shady zone, the better to uh, support um, individual winners and losers um, and individual rent seekers.
Okay. Um, two, three minutes on the Baku Tbilisi Jehan uh, pipeline. Uh, this pipeline was formally, formally inaugurated in July of this year after 10 years of lead up, design, construction, discussion, negotiation, diplomacy, legal, legalisms, and the whole bit. It runs for 1,700 kilometers from near Baku to the Turkish Mediterranean port of Jehan. It's an oil pipeline. It has a uh, sibling pipeline, the South Caucasus gas pipeline, the SCP, which runs from near Baku to the Georgian Turkish pipeline where the Turkish gas system picks up and takes the gas to Erzurum. The SCP, the gas pipeline, will be inaugurated in about a month's time. What's the significance of this, this pair of pipelines? Think back, please, to the, to the map that I showed you early on. These pipelines, contrary to that general picture of pipelines running north and only then west into Central and Western Europe, these pipelines go directly from the Caspian region to the marketplace, to uh, VLCC, very large crude carriers, the, the super tankers, that can take that oil to any refinery around the world that is interested to, uh, at the given price. Specifically, this, the, the Turkish Straits, the Bosporus, are bypassed by this, uh, these projects, by the oil project. Um, won't belabor this point. I'll simply um, stress that there's a lot of significance to Turkey, and there's a lot of significance to the Caspian countries to avoid taking tankers through the Bosporus. But that shouldn't be understood that, this, that the, the oil and gas reserves of Azerbaijan are, are game-changing. They are not. You can see that this projection of what Azerbaijan's production, production excuse me, output of crude oil will be in the year 2010 is 1.3 million barrels a day, as opposed to, these are historical 2003 data for these other countries. For comparative purposes, Russian production, 8.5 uh, million barrels a day. Um, that's now inched upward to uh, north of 9 million barrels a day. What's the significance of the BTC pipeline? First, that it creates these economic links among the three participating countries, and that it provides a, a new avenue for oil and potentially later for natural gas to move to markets without running through the monopolist pipeline systems of the Russian neighbor. I will not, I'm skipping past a lot at this point. I, none of this is to say that these projects, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan project and the South Caucasus pipeline, have been without controversy, complexity, and challenge. When you build hardwired infrastructure to the tune of billions of dollars across borders, across jurisdictions, inevitably, as I'm sure you can appreciate, you get into a situation where differing interests of national and subnational actors become very, very important. And the questions about who benefits in society, are these just flows of money that go to the hands of the leader of an individual country, or are there benefits that are palpable and understandable to individuals along that, uh, that pipeline routing? These are some of the, the, the very, very difficult questions. And in particular, there is the well uh, now documented challenge of what is referred to as Dutch disease. This slide shows the possible trajectory of revenues to only the government of Azerbaijan. The different colors are differing price levels, as you see over here. 
and what that would mean over time. If the average price were $60 per barrel over the lifetime of the, uh, these resources, it would be a peak of $20 billion per annum in around 2009. But the other point is, notice a quick drop off. Azerbaijan will experience in the next two to three years a tripling of GDP. The potential for this to lead to and to absolutely overwhelm the country in macroeconomic disbalance, Dutch disease, um, is a huge issue which I will be happy to talk about more in Q&A if you wish. All right, couple closing thoughts. The first goes to the developments within the, uh, the post-Soviet country. I've kind of galloped through this um, and uh, there are pieces that I haven't done basic justice to, um, but the picture that I hope I've succeeded to depict to you is the following, that the Caspian resources have the potential to play an important incremental uh, role in very, very tight global markets. But that Russian decision making, Russian policy, makes, will have a huge impact on what happens in the Caspian. And there are wild cards out there that are just unknown. How long will oil prices and gas prices stay elevated? Will they drop like a rock as they did in the, uh, in the 1980s? Or will there be a slow uh, uh, subsidence? When you say true energy security, you're talking about Europe or what? I am talking uh, about Europe's interest chiefly there in relation to the gas issue. Um, I'm also talking, and this will bleed over into a, a longer discussion, um, I, for discussion at another time, I, the, I, I would submit that uh, energy security uh, in a global market is enhanced through cooperation, through cooperative uh, efforts where there is a broad adherence to broad international norms. I'm being careful because I don't want, to, don't want to pretend that there's a single way that the oil and gas industry operates or other energy industries operate around the world, but um, the particular role that one has seen played by Russia in the last couple of years, namely a role of um, very, very pointedly injecting political uh, influence into uh, the energy industry. This is a, a, a direction that I think is both bad for Russia, it's also bad for consumer countries, this country, European countries, etc. You take me uh, as a nice segue to my final point. Um, I've commented several times on the prevalence of non-transparency and corruption I use the polite term rent-seeking all the time, um, as one of the standards, one of the, the constants in uh, the post-Soviet uh, energy world. And this is absolutely true around the Caspian, um, as it is also in Russia. This leads one to the, in the direction of, um, I would submit, very, very suboptimal outcomes for all parties because resources, monetized resources, one would think should flow to national good, not the good of individual leaders. If that does not happen, inevitably, citizens in these host countries, the producer countries, the transit countries, will not see benefits to the national good, and they will not, I would submit, support the continued development of those resources. Oh, by the way, there's also our side of the bargain, which is we, of course, um, are in a country with which with 14% of uh, global population consumes 25% of total primary energy supply. Um, tomorrow I'll do a separate talk on US energy security issues. Um, 
the core point of which, a core point of which, will be um, that our own effort at greater energy efficiency and energy conservation is an important part of the total picture, just as are the actions, the decisions that are made either in the Caspian countries uh, or in Moscow. So I'll be happy to take questions and um, hope that's been more or less comprehensible. Please. Oh. By the way, here's the, here's the site for that uh, Global Witness report if anybody is interested. Yeah, and do please go ahead, since this is being recorded on uh, video and audio, please do use the microphones up there. Um, I have two questions which are related. Uh, the importance of Western players and what's going on in the politics of the pipelines is interesting to me. I, you haven't really discussed that very much. And the other thing is, is there was a lot of talk way back about a pipeline through Afghanistan. And what's happened with that? Okay. I'll do those in reverse order. Um, there have been long-running discussions of the idea of either a gas or oil or both pipeline going from Turkmenistan or possibly even Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, across Afghanistan and into South Asia. Um, in the 1990s, the, it was UNICAL that was trying to push that idea uh, the most, most actively. Um, it never developed legs in the 1990s. The problem uh, was the instability of Afghanistan. The problem today could be the, um, oh yeah, the instability of Afghanistan. Um, there are also potential competing markets, particularly on gas, excuse me, competing uh, supply sources, uh, including the South Pars field uh, uh, in Iran, including gas from Qatar. So it's not really sure that that, not really clear that the, um, any such idea will ever come to pass. In terms of the importance of Western players, um, I, I thank you for the question because you highlight the fact that I uh, really de-emphasized uh, an important piece. Um, this is a very, I, I would submit that, that Western players, and I mean Western domiciled uh, energy companies and governments, um, including uh, the, uh, the U.S. government, both under the current administration and under uh, the Clinton administration. Um, all of those Western parties have played a very active role in trying to facilitate the development of resources around the Caspian and the transportation links to go along with them. Um, in the previous administration, when I was in government, we worked very hard on the idea of multiple pipelines out of the Caspian region specifically to undercut the monopolistic pressures that uh, Gazprom and Transneft um, wielded in that time and still substantially wield today. Um, I think that the, that the validity of that approach um, has been particularly underscored in the last couple of years. As you have seen across um, Russia and the Caspian, very, very concerted efforts by Russian policymakers and by the Russian companies to monopolize access that the Central Asian um, and Caucasus uh, producers have to international markets. I can elaborate separately if, you, if, you, if more questions than that. Please. Thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. Let me see if you can join an issue on, uh, on whether you, one would be able to relax the monopoly rent-seeking uh, um, power enjoyed by central government in Russia. The way you sketch it, uh, they seem to be doing optimally what they want. If, uh, there's no argument that if you would move it to a more market situation, it would be optimal for large numbers of consumers across all of Europe and the United States and the rest. But um, so the question comes something like this. Um, what strategies could be pursued other than the ones you've already suggested, namely alternative uh, gas supplies, to in effect relax or weaken essentially the Russian government's control over its gas and oil uh, monopoly? Because right now I, I find it difficult to see anything that is in the immediate 
uh, let's say, future yeah. that's going to change that. And for those who are in control of those resources, that's a very optimal strategy. Yeah. A couple of responses. Um, I, in a way, I share your, your pessimism about this. Uh, as a friend of mine, an industry friend of mine says, uh, when, uh, when oil prices are north of $50 a barrel, um, a whole lot of decision making by companies, including perfectly competent international companies uh, and less competent, um, as well as governments, looks you know absolutely perfect because the blemishes are not so manifest. The money just keeps pouring in. Um, so, part of me responds to your question by saying that the best thing that one can do is um, hope that prices uh, on the international market drop sooner rather than later. It's not a very active stance to be in. The second thing that one can do is um, uh, to uh, continue uh, to make the point that um, this government, and I think it's very important, it would be very important for European governments as well, um, to engage with the Caspian uh, producer countries on an active basis to help to ease some of the huge difficulty that you get into with transboundary infrastructure projects. Um, in order to have confidence to plunk down, in the case of BP and its partners uh, in, in Azerbaijan, $20 billion worth of investments, all told, to put down that kind of money on the table, you need to have some sense of confidence People in industry would say certainty, but I don't think you have certainty in life. Confidence that you will know what the regime will be for, I don't mean political regime, what the, what the legal regime will be uh, uh, that will govern your project throughout its lifetime. That's an area, for example, where um, governmental facilitation can help a lot. The question is, uh, do I expect um, oil prices to drop or rise? Uh, my unfair punt is to say that people who are paid um, huge amounts of money, hugely more than I, risk lots and lots of money on that question every day. Uh, my sus and so I, I, I step into these waters with great reluctance, um, but I would expect that there will be over time, and I mean in the next couple of years, a gradual subsiding of price because the oil and gas industry is a hugely cyclical um, business and in response to rising prices, the herd effect in all of the boardrooms uh, has been very much at play and so you've seen a substantial uh, rebound of capital expenditure budgets in all of these energy companies. And over time, with a you know, kind of five to seven year delay, those increased budgets will start to bear fruit. And this is why over time you end up with this cyclical nature uh, in energy prices. That doesn't diminish the general challenges that come from the demand environment uh, with both high demand levels in the U.S. and also high demand, growing demand in China and India. Please. Actually, that leads to my question. I have two questions, actually. What is the role or impact of China in this whole scenario, especially in terms of Central Asia? And my second question to you is, uh, certainly in light of Yuko's, um, the Shell contract issue in Sakhalin, now, I heard just the other day that Luke Oil is now under investigation as well by the Russian government for various things. Do you actually think that the Russian government is trying to renationalize the gas, oil and gas industry, or are they just trying to actually get a better deal out of this whole thing? Because I'm sure certainly in the 90s, they probably didn't get that great of a deal out of Shell and BP and everybody else. 
Um, thank you for the question. Uh, the role of China here is, is actually very interesting. Um, uh, and I, there are different, I would say, the roles of China, I guess, are, are really a more uh, appropriate way to answer. One of the roles that some of the Chinese companies have uh, played um, has been to enter into essentially state-to-state -state, um, deals, uh, which I would submit are, a, are, are bad for China, um, uh, bad for the recipient investment countries, because this is all inherently non-transparent. It compounds the problems that I was speaking about before. Again, that's been the role of some of the Chinese companies. Um, other of the Chinese companies have, I think, done, uh, uh, very, have, have entered into this world of uh, upstream investment in Central Asia in a very, very understandable, absolutely perfectly appropriate, that's my normative uh, lens, um, uh, manner. Uh, and I think that that's, it, these are Chinese companies responding to China's national interest, and that's great. The piece that makes me uncomfortable is the is the the state to state deals that are um, removed from uh, any kind of uh, light of day, any transparency. Is Russia is uh, the Putin's Kremlin trying to renationalize? Um, uh, President Putin and the people around him. Uh, were and are deeply, deeply offended by the weakness that Russia suffered from in the 1990s. And one of the manifestations of weakness that clearly um, chafes them to no end is the power, both economic and political, that the Russian oligarchs developed in the 1990s. Um, and it has been a single-minded element of policy under President Putin to limit that power and to put the oligarchs in their place. It's not enough that the oligarchs in the, in the mindset of the Siloviki, the, the, uh, the Russian security services vets who are now in the Kremlin, it's not enough that the, the oligarchs um, exploited all the shadows and the gaps of legality, even venturing into illegality in, in cases, uh, to become fabulously wealthy people overnight. Um, in the process, destroying that great Soviet uh, uh, economy, which, uh, the, whose passing uh, President Putin uh, labeled as the greatest tragedy of our times. Um, it's worse yet for the Hodorkovskys uh, and, and others who then tried to parlay that economic power into political power as well. Um, that is unacceptable in the worldview of the people now making decisions in the Kremlin. Do they need to national, renationalize in order to gain control? Probably not. I mean, the sad state of affairs, sad in my opinion, again, this is all you know, my subjective uh, set of uh, views. The sad truth is that um, uh, with the successive uh, uh, diminution of press freedom, with the closing of opportunities for civil society to act as any kind of a check or balance in Russian society, um, more and more people all across that society are concluding this is not the time to have your head above the parapet. So you probably don't even need actually to take title over, uh, you know, a, a yukos, one yukos is a pretty darn good uh, indication and warning. And, you know, pretty much I think that, that there's no need to actually take title, excuse me. Please. Um, well, as long as our economy so strongly depends on oil, gas, and coal. I think it seems quite hopeless to influence the major players, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and other countries uh, by the established power games we all know about. Um, wouldn't it be more reasonable to just focus on uh, the alternatives that are there? They may be still a bit more costly with the renewable energy, energy efficiency and all these, but I think rather than investing all the money 
in, uh, in the Middle East or uh, in, in Russia and, and other parts of the world to continue with fossil fuels, wouldn't it be really more uh, productive to invest uh, all the money at home, even if it costs some, some money? Right. Thank you for the question. Um, I, first of all, I mean, I, I, I don't think he meant that uh, there, there are plenty of opportunities, and I'm, and I'm sure this is well known to you uh, based on your, your work, um, plenty of opportunities for cost-effective energy efficiency improvements in this economy and in many others around the world. I find it very, very interesting that um, uh, the EU Energy Commissioner, Mr. Pibalgs, has set a goal of a 20% uh, increase, excuse me, decrease in energy intensity um, in the EU in the coming, I've forgotten what time period, 10 years, I think. Um, this out of a, a set of countries who's, uh, from whom the United States could learn large amounts about energy efficiency to begin with. Um, so point one, um, there's cost-effective things uh, that one can and should be doing in the energy efficiency, the demand reduction arena today. Secondly, um, I say I would respond to your broader question uh, that for better or for worse, uh, we are in a situation where I believe we have no choice but to walk and chew gum at the same time, if you will. We are, the, the enormity of our dependence on uh, petroleum, particularly as a transportation fuel, in the near term, I think brings one to the conclusion that we are going, to, that we cannot turn around that blunt economic reality um, overnight. Am I in favor, though, of your basic point to um, do, I, I, I would say, let me end this way. Reductions in our demand, which are absolutely achievable through the right set of policies, which requires the right politics, those demand reductions can have a very significant impact at the margin. Remember that we are talking about um, global oil, oil, first and foremost, markets that are so tight that an unanticipated demand increment of a million barrels a day of uptick in demand uh, in, in one corner of the world or another has the potential to upset the apple cart. If the U.S. were to get serious about energy efficiency, we could very quickly begin the process of trying to take some of that fear factor out of global markets and calm uh, the markets, th thereby substantially improving our own circumstance and the circumstance of other countries that are in that marketplace. I, I'm, I, I am absolutely in favor of, um, uh, of cost-effective renewables. I mean, one of the problems I think is, is how to uh, help the uh, development of renewable energies such that one is not um, uh, doing economically irrational things. And that's, I, I've just kind of loaded too much into one uh, little sentence, but um, I think it is important to pursue um, renewables, as you suggest. Please. Uh, do you happen to know what are the clients for the Caspian gas under the condition of new pipeline that goes to the Mediterranean Sea? Okay. Um, the gas which you're referring to is from the Shaktanese uh, uh, deposit, which is offshore from Baku. Um, the initial production, which is all that has been contractually committed so far, uh, will serve demand in Azerbaijan and Georgia and Turkey. Um, there will be successive, successor uh, stages to the project, and there is a discussion that is ongoing now about some of that uh, production going into uh, southeastern and uh, western Europe. Uh 
So in that case, why that pipeline wasn't built, for example, under Black Sea, going straight to Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe? Right. Um, as I mentioned several times in the, in the course of the discussion, uh, when you start talking about um, oil and gas infrastructure in general and uh, pipeline infrastructure as a part of that, you're talking about big, big, big bucks. Um, and anytime you start doing additional complications like very deep water um, crossings, uh, the costs and therefore the costs go through the roof and the economic justification for the project can be more and more subject to doubt. Uh, Russia built the Blue Stream pipeline which runs from Russian territory to Turkey, Turkish territory um, and did so as a strategic diversification of its own thereby avoiding um, having to put more of its gas across Ukraine um, uh, but uh, if you're, if I'm uh, BP and, or Statoil and partners uh, in the Shakhtar News project, um, I certainly wouldn't want to uh, do a multi-billion dollar bet on a sub black sea pipeline. It wouldn't make economic sense. Sure. The US uh, Energy Information Agency is forecasting very large increases of uh, liquid, uh, liquefied natural gas imports in the United States over the next 20 years. Uh, what impediments uh, do you foresee in that? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of impediments, uh, not least of which, again, is capital. Um, the predicted increases um, require uh, tens of billions of dollars of investment upstream in new production of gas places like the Stockman uh, uh, prospect that was the subject of uh, news stories in the last couple of weeks. Um, it also requires uh, liquefaction um, uh, capability, regasification capability, and new build, uh, new construction of uh, LNG tankers. So the tens of billions of dollars of capital requirements are one obstacle unto themselves. Secondly, in the United States, um, we have a very, very broad problem that comes from talking out of two sides of our mouth at the same time. Um, and this is always kind of typified to me by um, a uh, Chevy Suburban um, sport utility vehicle that I saw in suburban Washington with a Greenpeace bumper sticker on it. <laughs> My attitude is, you know, one way or the other, but, you know, not both at the same time. Um, citing uh, citing uh, LNG regasification, terminals and regasification facilities is an extremely controversial matter. Up and down the U.S. East Coast uh, and the U.S. West Coast, um, local, uh, uh, local interests have successfully dissuaded companies from pursuing projects or are still seeking to do so. Is this the right of those people in those areas? Hell yes. Um, but how is it that we meet our uh, national energy requirements um, if we continually then say, but, but I sure as hell don't want that LNG plant near me? Um, I think we've got some serious thinking to do in this regard. And I, I, this is a, um, to me, this is the chief challenge uh, that is out there to be solved. In relation to LNG, I mean. Could you expand a bit more on your brief remarks about BP's multi-billion dollar investment in Russia? I mean, they have, aren't they taking a tremendous risk that Russia will provide the legal and other stability that be required to recover that investment? Or do they have so much money they can afford to <laughs> take very high risks? Um, first of all, my comment was about uh, tens of billions in, in the Caspian region, but it is equally true that BP has uh, tens of billions invested in the TNK BP venture uh, in Russia. Uh, and the future of that venture, against the backdrop of the 
the series of events that uh, uh, the questioner here asked about earlier, um, there are lots of questions, lots of intelligent questions that one would be asking logically about the future health of that of that undertaking. Um, nonetheless, TNKBP has been making money hand over fist. Uh, it was a I'm not going to be exactly right on this. BP's 50% of that venture was on the order of $8 billion worth of investment. Now, as discussion goes on about their Russian partners cashing out, the numbers that one sees in the trade press about the value of the Russian partners' 50% is $25 billion and up. So in the course of uh, you know, a handful of years, um, if you believe those valuations, then in addition to the, the cash that the TNKBP venture has been throwing off, you know, like it's water, um, they have a huge upside there potentially as well. Now, all of this is absolutely cardinally affected by um, the question of whether or not Mr. Putin's worldview has room to accommodate um, interested, capable, uh, well-resourced international companies operating within Russia and doing so profitably. And my crystal ball on that one is not real good. This is going to be sort of quick, bounce around on you. Um, Africa, um, you know, the problems we brought, brought up in terms of China, and certainly a country that not, has not benefited was Nigeria, when you talk about uh, transparency, I mean, in terms of the people. Yep. Uh, my last commentary is, um, read back, uh, and this isn't related, but to a country, the poor Russians have really suffered considerably, uh, the people. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think I read someplace that the suicide, uh, 60,000 a year, which put, puts them only second to, uh, what was the other country? Very small country in the region. Mm. Huh? No? You'll come to me, but uh, okay. if you want to comment, I mean, I, I know it's sort of outside the jurisdiction. No, no, I, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, first of all, in terms of, uh, you know, the Nigeria example is the poster child of, of how anybody who has, um, spoken, including me, who has spoken in favor of uh, Western involvement in the oil and gas development of the Caspian. It's the poster child of what you, one must feel you must do everything not to uh, allow it to happen. Not all of the decisions, obviously, are in the hands of uh, anybody outside of the country. Um, but there have been important steps that, uh, uh, though I would say not complete steps, um, that have been taken by a couple of the host uh, countries. Uh, you may be familiar with the uh, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which is an initiative that was promulgated uh, first and foremost by the Blair um, uh, government, whose objective is to try to create transparency about how much money is flowing from oil and gas and other extractive industry projects into governmental coffers then to set up the, the, the capability to ask questions like, well, is that all the money that should have ended up in those coffers? What's happening with the money once it's in those coffers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Azerbaijan uh, signed up as a test, as a volunteer, as a test case for um, uh, the, the template for EITI and this initiative. Um, they set up a, a state oil fund um, that is internationally audited, et cetera, et cetera. There are still problems in terms of actually how the money gets spent, and that's a huge, huge uh, challenge that's still ahead. Uh, not to allow, uh, not to sit back and watch, this is not really a question of allow, not to sit back and watch Azer Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan or whoever become the next Nigeria. As to um, suffering of the Russian people, I, 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 I don't argue with that point at all. There's been a huge the, the disruption for people in Russia and in all of the other post-Soviet states, the disruption since 1991 and the human impact has been absolutely 
uh, stupendous. You know, it's, it's terrible to contemplate. Uh, but this is, unfortunately, that this is called the hangover that you get after, um, it, and again, here I freely acknowledge my, my bias, um, you know, it was not, it, it was Soviet decision making and Soviet economics and politics that led to the breakdown and the dissolution of that country, and in turn, to the suffering of people after. Yeah, I just, I think it was Lithuania was number one. Okay. In terms of the suicide rate, which is a country of about what, three million people. Yeah. So no, it's, it's a terrible tragedy. It is a terrible, terrible human tragedy. There's no question. Uh, I hate to broach this subject in a way, and I, maybe you don't want to answer it at all, but when I alluded to Western policies in, the, in this whole topic, I was thinking about the effects of the invasion of Iran, of, of Iraq, the possible wars in Iran, mm -hmm. um, the Afghanistan incursion. Uh, you haven't touched at all about this, and the question is, is what, you know, what do you think the uh, politics of global oil and gas had in these conflicts? Well, first of all, I, I use your question as a, a uh, opportunity for a public service announcement tomorrow at uh, noon, is it? Um, I, I've been asked to speak about U.S. energy security, and I'll, I'll get into those kind of questions in a, in a bit more uh, detail there. At the YMCA, uh, you. Thank you. Yes, at the YMCA. Um, the radio appearance. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm also being interviewed at, on uh, WILL AM tomorrow. So my, uh, but my, uh, in a way, your, your question relates more naturally to, to, to tomorrow's discussion. I, I, I am not somebody who uh, is inclined to view uh, the actions of the current administration in Iraq or its posture vis-a-vis -vis Iran, North Korea, et cetera, as centrally about oil. Uh, my editorial commentary with which people can, can and inevitably will, uh, will disagree or not, as each decides, is that uh, for a whole long list of screwed up reasons, um, we have engaged in a terrible, terrible tragedy in Iraq, which will haunt U.S. interests for decades and decades to come. Uh, but was it chiefly about oil? No, I actually don't think it was. Control, hubris, stupidity, uh, lots and lots, you know, you know, false. It, they tried to kill dad, uh, you know, when, when, not a pretty picture. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope I've uh, not bored you all to tears, and uh, if anybody has individual questions, I'd be happy to take them afterward. <laughs>